I, you know what, what really bad, like is staggering about what you pulled off with this movie. It is, you were a part of, I think the most significant scientific achievement <laughs> outside of anything pandemic related in the past year and a half. Pretty wild. Yeah. I mean, yeah. um, because this was a huge deal and a, it's like you directed a documentary that's also one of the most terrifying horror movies ever. Yeah. Um, it's it's interesting because when I, well, two things. One, like it feels weird to say this, but the, the murder of Hornet was a huge light for me in a very grim year. Right. Like, and, and ironically, who would have thought? Like, I didn't. I mean, I, I, I would have never imagined that this giant hornet would offer me this, this, this space to sort of distract myself from the realities of everything else. Like, really, that's what ultimately it comes down to. When I read, when I read the New York Times article, that was the first like introduction to this murder hornet was the piece in the New York Times, which was early May. And it, in you know in the headline it's murder hornet and of course like everybody else I was having a terrible I was down I was going nowhere uh, and was having a terrible moment and a, and then it was murder hornets and it was like of course like why not yeah let's have murder hornets too like it became <laughs> this whole <laughs> it, it, it became, is yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and then I. From that article, Mike, who's a journalist, did a beautiful job in just um, essentially telling a story about the characters, who the scientists and the beekeepers, who were expected to stop this and had really had no, you know, this is a new, this is a very new thing for everyone involved. Nobody had resources, and here we had this potential you know for this to become a very big issue and you've got this you've got this group of beekeepers and scientists on the front lines saying well this is this hunt may be impossible but we're going to give it a shot and try to do our best and I wasn't drawn into anything around like even really the hornet or the natural history or even so much the science initially I was drawn into just the characters and these people like having to basically band together to try to do something that seemed impossible, right? To try to stop an invasive species. Like, it's like, wait, what, 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 what happens? Like, how do you do that? Right. And that's one of the, it, getting to like, see the day-to-day -day of that process and sort of just how exhausting and demoralizing and just uh, frustrating it is when you're trying to find like a needle in a bee stack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It yeah. was, I, I mean, I, I felt like when I, when I, when you're first introducing us to these people, I was like, this is no different from the ragtag group that like Bruce Willis assembles and like Armageddon this is exactly the same. And, <laughs> and they have these fascinating personalities and their job is so important, but they're like the unsung heroes of everything. They're not going to get a ticker tape parade, even though they deserve it. Yeah. And I, I just, I had like pages and pages of questions. Cause I was like, holy shit, this is such a great, <laughs> how did the, the, the first one, like starting right at the beginning, you read this article, you're just like all of us where you're like, great murder hornets. Let's just unleash yeah. that on top of a killer virus. Sounds great. Right. And how, though, did the documentary itself get started? Was that something that you pitched or was, did they call you? Yeah, so no, I, um, I, read, I read that article and I thought, hey, here's something that I can work on right now without leaving my home. Like my challenge was, how can I put together a pitch without going anywhere? And um and so I reached out to folks like Chris and the characters on Zoom, and I had conversations with them late at night, just trying to understand this issue and like trying to get to know them and understand them. Um, and really like 
came to love them on a, on a lot of different levels and just was really absorbed. It, it became this, again, this giant distraction. It was like, oh, COVID, oh, murder hornets. Like, just tell me, like, let me, I want to understand all this. And so after I had done that and I kind of developed the story and the characters, um, then it was like, okay, how do we find an audience for the film? Who do we pitch to? How do we make this thing? Like, I, it still felt like something that wouldn't get made, frankly. And um, and and honestly, like I'm used to like have going out and shooting and spending all this time and getting the pitch right. And this was sort of like, I can do this right now. I can do it in my closet. And it's interesting and let's just see where it goes. And um, once I got the pitch developed and sort of the story developed, my wife, Lindsay, was like, well, you should take it to Discovery. And I was like, Discovery, what? Why would, I, I've never worked with Discovery before. Like, the, it, I just didn't feel like that they would be drawn to a film, a character-driven film about a giant hornet. And, um, but I did, I listened to her as like, every time I listen to her, it only goes well. And I thought, okay, yeah, let's like, why not? And so then I pitched it over Zoom in my closet, like, you know, uh, like Lindsay and the kids left the house because I was so worried it was going to be too noisy and I was going to get distracted <laughs> and have a good whatever. So they left and I connected with um, Howard Schwartz, who's my executive producer on this. And we connected right off the bat. And he like, we, you know, we, we, were, we were both fans of horror and genre films. I've never met this guy in my life. Keep in mind that like, if somebody would have told me a year ago, like, hey, you're gonna pitch something over Zoom to a network you have never worked with before, I'd be like, you're out of your mind. Like, I can't work that way. I'd be like, no, I have to meet him. I gotta like, half of it, it for me is being able to just feel someone right like and be in their physical presence so this was kind of a challenge like i was like okay well i got to do the zoom thing and we really actually connected we connect about horror and and he knew about troll 2 and best first movie all these things so it was it went really really well and um i got off that zoom Lindsay came home and I, she's like, well, how did it go? And I was like, well, I, I think like the next movie I'm gonna make is gonna be about this giant hornet. Like it felt at that moment, like, hey, this could actually happen. Um, and then within weeks from that time, we moved to Washington, and and I was hanging out with you know people that I had only met on Zoom and talked wow. about. His, yeah, and so. just surrounded by bottles and bottles of orange juice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How did you find a crew that was willing to actively pursue the greatest biological threat that our country <laughs> has seen? Um, the, that is because I'm thinking to myself always as a person that started behind the camera that yeah. the especially the camera people are always the unsung heroes because their job is to capture and stick it out and don't interfere. And in this case, there's a hornet that sprays acid sometimes. <laughs> like, yeah. How do you hire somebody that wants to do that? Well, so I have a team of, I, uh, you know, like it, you work with somebody on something at some point it's, it's, it, in, in filmmaking where you they become like family right and and so this something that's really important to me specifically with this was known variables uh, uh you know like in every way because there was so much that was unknown so hmm. i would have only done this if i knew that i had the team that i knew that you know that it was going to one be enjoyable two that we would end up with something that we were proud of. And so we, so Rich, so Rich Wong and I shot it on two cameras, we were both filming and Rich shot my, um, my, my Netflix movie, the Bob Owen curriculum, Girlfriend's Day. And he's like him and his wife, we're like family now. Like, and uh, he also likes to climb out on limbs with me. And, um, and, I could go on and on. Like our team was 10 people from like COVID safety officer 
to to you know uh, to, to me and um, um, but we also had to we had to edit as we were shooting so my editor this this gal named Samantha Smart worked with her on numerous things and she's amazing because she's not only incredibly talented but she's just like so um, so calm and so, such a joy to work with. Like I can be losing my mind on something and she's like, let's just problem solve and figure it out. And she's Oof. just amazing. Love that. Yeah. And so, so the luxury of this was everyone who worked on it with me, I had worked on them well, intimately on other projects. And so, except for the COVID, like the COVID safety officer was a new guy, like a new person, but um, everybody else, I brought them here. So it was kind of like a, almost like a, I mean, we had COVID on top of it. So we had to have our editorial pod completely separate and our production pod, like we had to be very, there's a whole new layer of complexity to it. But in making it, it was sort of like, I was able to bring my family and filmmaking friends together around this thing so um, and thank goodness because I mean it I just I think that um I saw maybe on insta that at one point did you maybe bring home like the the <laughs> the samples of the murder hornets that they had preserved I I, I brought home live murder hornets because they waited my, they were live ones they, they were live <laughs> Yeah. What? Yeah. They're, they're, well, here's, 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 a, here's some insight into the kind of person that I am. So the only regret that I have on this whole, whole film is because, so my kids were, they didn't really know a whole lot about what I was doing, except that it was murder points. And they were very like, it ranged like, surprisingly, my five-year-old loved them and thought they were super cute. And my 13 year old was like, oh my, why are we living here? There's murder points. That's what <laughs> uh, um, and so one day I brought home uh, some live murder hornets in a, in a jar because my, I wanted to show them to my kids. And prior to that, I had actually brought home some dead ones and they had done Zooms with their classes and was really exciting for them. So I thought, oh, I'll bring home some live ones. And I did. And uh, they were terrified um, and also in just like complete trans, you know, they were, they were transfixed. I mean, here's this, here is this almost folklore at this point, like mythical creature in this jar and they're getting to see it for the first time. But my regret was that I didn't, when they went to bed, um, I ended up having to freeze the hornets and then send them into a, a science lab. And I wish I would have just waited another day when they went to bed, taken the live hornets out and put them in a secret jar and left the jar open on the table in the morning so that when they came out to see how their murder hornets, <laughs> how their murder hornets were doing, they would be like, dad, they're, they, they got out. And so I, like, I, if I could rewind time, <laughs> I would, I would fix that. Like I would go back to that moment. Uh, Cause it was, I, it is a regret. You are a monster. And <laughs> no, I, <yeah. laughs> oh my God. I am. Uh, so, yeah. So when you're dealing with, as a, the aforementioned cast of characters, like these, like, so you've got your beekeepers that I personally found like a little bit uh, more relatable. So it's like Ted and Ruthie are like these really kind of sweet, just small business owners that have, you know, and Ted's bees have been murdered and again super scary like that super scary just kicks the documentary off and I'm like oh great so I'm gonna have to stress eat perfect <laughs> um and then but then you've got folks like Chris that seem like a little pricklier and he has he fascinates me because he has this humanitarian motivation like he he's a good person but that doesn't mean that you necessarily want to hang around him and you're in this high stress environment. So were there any kind of like special tactics or, or sort of any kind of emotional way that you approached 
working with people that might you might not normally be talking with in your documentary because like your previous work is like these are people that like they have haunted houses and they want to share and they're show people kind of and that now you have these folks that don't really seem the same yeah interesting yeah um i think like for me um i like i you have to think like at the beginning of this whole thing there wasn't even a there wasn't even a guarantee that we would find a single hornet right like so there we're, we're out on a limb and it's like we got to tell a story about this we may not even see a single one right right um but but for me like i was more interested again in in the characters who who occupies this world who is expected to pursue and stop this thing that is never that they've never done before so that was really interesting and you have obviously ted who this is personal right and it, it attacked his bees and then you've and 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 religious family and it's very much like we have god help us and then you have science and you have chris and you have sven and and government uh essentially pest control you know public service workers who um the thing i did not see coming and making this was i knew that i would learn a lot of cool things about bees I knew I would learn a lot of cool things about hornets. I I knew that uh, I had no idea there, you know, we'd find a nest, I had no idea, all these sorts of things I knew, but I never actually imagined um, how I would feel for public service and for these this thankless faction of government who really there's no there's no ego in any of it, which was really interesting, especially specifically with Chris, because his whole purpose was to just make sure he wasn't a slug taking up government money and he just did his job. He was not out to do it for attention. He wasn't any of these sorts of things. He was there to do his job well. And I didn't see that coming uh, at all and was taken by it and, and not again like terrible way of answering your question but i think at the beginning for me it just starts with a respect for each individual and finding ways to like just be curious and and identify and relate with them for what they're faced with and and what's at stake for them personally and i get really taken and enamored by personalities and people and so when I'm curious about somebody, I could sit in a room with them and there'd be absolutely nothing and I would still find something interesting about them. This, this was this like gift in that we had Ted and then we have Ruthie, who's this awesome community, like citizen scientist who's like, I got to do something. And we have these scientists who are like very like, you know, very like methodical um, um, and, and, and really just want to make a difference, you yeah. know, you know, and, and let's face it, like the odds were that they would fail, right? The odds were that none of it would work. Um, but they keep going. They keep, yep. Chris keeps putting up traps, like, you know, they, they, you know, it, it, he says at one point that, it's, you know, he's, he's so frustrated that he's emptying these traps and he's setting them up and he can't, and nothing's happening. And he's like, but I can't, I never get the satisfaction of actually catching it unless I do the work. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, like, that's a good lesson for me to remember that the day-to-day -day is what gets you to the big goals. It's so true. Yeah. And, he's, and it, he's like the Ron Swanson, by the way, of, <laughs> of like the story. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, he's done, and then you take that again, like, you know, when they, when they, you know, have some failure, right? Like they glue the hornet's wings or, or whatnot, and, and to see them persist through the failure and still continue, and and again, these are guys who are like thankless, who are kind of in the public eye, right? Like there's scrutiny and they're expected to oh. stop this thing. Chris is the first person to say, we don't know what the hell we're doing. Like we didn't know anything about the giant hornet. And they, but they're in the ring. 
they're they're expected to do something about it. And science, like more times than not, is failure, right? It's an iterative process. And it felt like science in real time and seeing them fall and get back up and fall and get back up. And meanwhile, the whole time I'm like, I would have quit. I would have quit a yep. long time ago. Like I would have been like, ah, eh, whatever. Yeah, like, uh, I mean, so, and anytime that you say thankless when you're talking about these people is totally true. Cause I mean, they're getting vilified in the press that it's heartbreaking. And again, like you're saying, they persist and it's, it's pretty incredible. And I, I found myself the whole time, just like, how did you guys, especially with a crew of 10, that's pretty large. I mean, in my head for how intimate this feels and for yeah. how you're focusing on something that's huge, but only in the insect world, how yeah. do you stay out of these people's way? Because you're there to document the process, but at the same time, yeah. it is absolutely critical, certainly to our country and our continent. <laughs> so, yeah. but that's like a lot of pressure. How do you yeah. just keep out of the way while still getting your shots? It's, it's a, uh, it's, it's a balance, right? Like it is a thing where, and, and again, like 10, there's, it, it, it's trying, you, you develop relationships uh, of, of mutual respect and trust. And the goal is to get to the point to where they don't even realize that you're there. Mm -hmm. and, and and we do get and we 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 always get there but it's a process it's like okay and it really is like a relationship that you have to like ease into it and make sure that there is there's trust and respect and um even though we had 10 people like we you know there were times where it's like most we had to like be able to assemble and disassemble very fast and if we were like with a hornet and Rich and I were shooting the hornet and they were had the hornet in their hand, the rest of our team had to be away. So we had it, it's 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 not like when you make a movie and everyone's standing around and there's this whole huge footprint. Now that said, if you talk to the WSDA, they would say, "Wow, there's a lot," you know, like because they are they aren't used to that much interference right right they're not or that sort of footprint so they're there this was new for them and honestly like my fear from the beginning in making this film was not of the hornet my fear was working with government and trying creatively to get access to the sorts of things that i knew would make for a good story and knowing that i'd have the bureaucracy and the red tape of just working with a government institution like that was a huge fear and to you know there's there's a gal over there named Carla Salp who is their head of communications person and, and she couldn't have not been more uh of an ally and a support from the very beginning like it, it very much like uh, I'm I I see what you guys want to do I'm going to help you and I'm going to add value every step of the way I'm going to make this easy and so that was huge like you can't honestly if it wouldn't have been for her and her support in getting the whole te team from the WSDA behind it we wouldn't have had a movie right right uh, we love the communications departments for that reason. It's like, they do understand the value of what you've done, because I think that watching this movie is also a way to get them support because what they do is so on the DL that right. now that people can turn on discovery plus and just see this, we can, right. it's like normal people like me are like, wow, this is imperative that this exists. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and it, it's easy to be like, again, and that's where my mindset has shifted before. And you know, when you see government and citizens actually working together and it working, you're like, there's hope. <laughs> like, yes. Oh, this is how it's supposed to work. So now, but you know, you would talk, you would ask me about like interference, and we did have like moments where like we had in the scene where they, you know find the nest and this is the sort of anxiety that's always created with nonfiction because you're always afraid you're going to miss something like going into this it was like I have got to stay on this every step of the way because if I tell it after the fact I'll be gutted and it will mean not the same thing like I wanted to see it in real time so we were um, in the film when they were 
testing their new technology in that city park. It was towards the end of what they thought was going to be the opportunity of even finding a nest. And I went to that shoot thinking they're probably not going to find a nest. Like I need to start thinking about ending this story and talking about next year and, and where to go from here. And we didn't do it this, all these things were going through my head when they were, you know, testing that new technology at the park. And that afternoon, that's when they got the call about the other hornet that had been trapped. And then the next day we were with them at that location where they find the nest. But it happened in a way, I mean, we were with them for hours upon hours walking through everywhere. And to the point where both Rich and I, we hadn't eaten lunch, we were grumpy. And then our cameras start interfering with their technology. No. And yeah, and all of a sudden they're like, guys, you can't shoot anymore. Like we're getting static, we're getting interference. Out of nowhere, it's like, wait, what? Why is this happening now? And they're like, sorry guys, like we can't, it's not working. We couldn't figure it out. Fortunately, we had backup cameras, different model in the car. And we were like, okay, wait, wait, let's just, we'll switch to the backup cameras. We'll get those other cameras in hopefully and get the other cameras in. And 10 minutes later, they find the nest. And so it's like, you're that close <laughs> to missing it all because of something that's like, you know, so yeah. Jesus. I, I mean, and so just that moment as a director of a documentary where you are previously thinking, maybe I'm just going to have to wrap it up. Maybe there's, this is never going to happen. Just right. what was that exact moment? Like when they found the nest Were you, what was it like? Oh, I was, um, I was overjoyed beyond, beyond control to where I actually, when I was going through the footage with my editor, Sammy, I was like, oh, why did I shout at this point? This shot could have been longer. Like I was lost in the moment. Like I literally was no longer a, a filmmaker. And I was with these guys who found the nest and, and had totally like all of my emotions took over. Like all of a sudden now I want like, it, it, it's hard to explain in that it was very much like a discovery. Like I was like, this is history. Wow, they did it. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh shoot, I'm rolling too. I gotta be quiet, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, like that's the sort of thing that you have and you can see in like the outtake stuff that we didn't, that, that we cut, like I'm shouting uh, because I'm so excited. And all of a sudden I'm not the filmmaker. I'm like the guy, I'm, I'm with them in this moment that is really, you know, monumental. Uh, yeah. uh, so I, very- I feel and, like, and then, <laughs> oh, go ahead. I know. And then it's this moment of just like, wow. Like Rich and I looked at each other and we were like, we have a movie. Like, yes, like, you do. We would have never like, you know, I mean, it was, it was, it, felt like we were this was all supposed to happen uh and you can't explain how or why but it did and you're just really grateful you know I couldn't believe it as I as I'm it's it's one of the most satisfying <laughs> just beginning middles and ends to a documentary that I've ever seen I was so proud of you I just having followed your work for all this time and like I I it, it's it's amazing that we have this on film <laughs> and so i'll last question because again we could go i have two pages <laughs> but last question did you guys have any close calls like was there any th time where you were like oh god this is nature yikes uh, oh yeah oh yeah i mean so uh ironically not with the not with the murder hornets right like it, every time we were with them or shooting them, they'd come off ice. And I wasn't ever, I never had this moment of like, oh God, murder hornets. I, because I was with the scientists and because I sort of took my cues off of the experts, like, and I was with them in this moment, it felt, it felt more like a discovery, like, wow, I'm on another planet. I'm at the bottom of the ocean. I'm seeing a new species. Like, it's really exciting. So I never like had a, well, 
That's not entirely true. So the the shot on there's a shot where the hornet's on the apple, about to take flight, and I was shooting I was shooting that shot and it was preening itself, and then it took off, and in the cut it comes right towards my face and I drop the camera and I duck out of the way. Um, that was the one moment where I was like, oh, this is not good. Um, um, and, but the irony of it all was that I was shooting with Ted at night with bees. I've never shot with bees before. I've never been in a bee suit before. Um, and it's dark and I, it's, it's incredible experience because it's, you don't see anything and you hear just the bees all around you and the sound that they make and the way that it makes you feel it like you can't place the sound it almost feels like it's vibrating inside of you like it's a very distinct sound and a really cool thing but as i was shooting i looked and on the on my net of my face my face mask or my net or whatever they call it i look and i see this bee crawling up silhouette and I look at it and I focus on it and I'll, I realize I was like, oh, that's that's on the inside of my suit. And and then within seconds I was stung and I'd left a little, um, there's a part in the suit, like they're designed to not let anything in, but of course I didn't put mine on right. And I had a tiny little hole here and the bees were going into my suit. So that's that bee stung me. And then within like a minute, not even a minute, six or seven others had stung me. <laughs> so, oh <my> God. <laughs> so, 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 uh, so the yeah. bees then were you're reminded, you're like nature, <laughs> uh, right? Nature. And so really the, the bees are the divas and the hornets somehow were the well-behaved, like easy to work with. Yeah. I mean, wow. again, I wouldn't have seen it. I wouldn't have seen it coming. Like so, like so many other things this year, uh, I am uh, I'm super surprised, and I shouldn't be. <laughs> it's like just whatever you think is true, just think also the opposite is probably what's going to happen. So.